Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the day after Valentine's Day edition of Bull Sessions. My name is Mark Robertson. I'm joined here by Ken Kabula. Ken, did you have a good Valentine's Day? We had a wonderful Valentine's Day, Mark. Uh, I remembered it, and I bought presents and, and everything, so it worked out real, real nicely. I opened a meeting last night for Herb, uh, Herb Lemkul, who's down in Florida, and I opened his investment club meeting so that he could meet, and he's telling me that he went out for Valentine's Day dinner with his wife. He asked me to guess what it was they had for dinner. Oysters. So, uh, no, they had liver and onions. Can you believe that for Valentine's Day? <laughs> well, if that's, if that's what uh, your if, objective if that's is. What, if that's what does it for you, yeah. <laughs> well, my mom used to have a rule that you you ordered things at restaurants you didn't make at home. And that that was one of the things. Oh, yeah, that's my one mom of the... would do that. She would have friends over and she loved her chicken chicken lovers dinner. Yeah, yeah. Well, and that's probably because we were living in Detroit at the time in Indianapolis. <laughs> well, so did, so did you have a good Valentine's Day, Kim? Well, I got two phone calls and a dear friend, um, Ken Gar, who I met over in uh, one of the national conventions. He sent really? me a box of C's chocolate. So, boy, do I have a grin on my face. Well, I'm envious. Ken Gar never sent me any chocolate. Yeah. No. <laughs> so let's get ourselves underway here, Mark. Right. So we're going to talk a little bit about the Super Bowl, Super Bowl, a little bit on Bonnie and Clyde, a little bit on the family feud, and a little bit of a of a corrective moment, uh, as we'll get into in a minute. And we'll talk a little bit about the Super Bowl indicator, but the majority is going to be just a random walk. How, how's that for a pun, Ken? A random walk through inflation, just making some right. observations. And uh, we'll close with the E-Trade baby which is now the Morgan Stanley baby, but uh, he made a comeback during the Super Bowl in, in the 32nd spot, $7 million, by the way, $7 million worth of E-Trade baby for 30 seconds. Wow. All right. Let's go ahead and get underway with the boilerplate. No investment recommendation is intended. This is all about educational demonstration. We are uh, attempting to interpret and deploy the principles, methods, techniques, and analysis of the of common stocks as championed by the modern investment club movement over the last eight decades. So you're going to hear opinions. Please, please, please do your own homework before making any type of uh, investment decision. Uh, we may hold shares in companies that we discuss, and we'll be careful to disclose that. We'll try to remember to do that. We do a monthly program where we share four or five ideas and the analysis of those ideas uh, known as the round table. It's on Tuesday evenings, usually the last Tuesday in a month. And we've been doing that for about 12 years and we have a 18 or 19% uh, internal rate of return over that period of time. If you'd like to be added to our re email reminder list for that uh, session, send it to nkabula1 at comcast.net and then my email address and Ken's email address are at the bottom of the page if you have any follow-up to today's session, including suggestions for future topics. Well, and Mark, just as you announced that it's usually the last Tuesday of the month, the roundtable uh, for February, the February roundtable will actually be on March 1st. So those of you looking for a roundtable on February 22nd, there won't be one but it will be held on March 1st. You're trying to make it tough on me. That's our black tie uh, red carpet affair. So it's a good one. And we usually have a pretty strong attendance and hand out some awards. And our, I believe our stock selection prowess during February has been pretty good over the years. So it's usually a pretty good session. All right, here's where we'll go today. We are going to talk a little bit about inflation here in a few minutes. I do want to have a quick reminder on the Super Bowl indicator. Uh, a few moments of uh, Mark eating a little bit of crow and sharing some moments with Bonnie and Clyde and Steve Harvey. And uh, we'll do a quick update on best small companies, but uh, uh, just the usual stuff. We will be returning to those programs at the bottom. And uh, let's go ahead and get underway. Anything you want to add to that, Ken or Kim? 
No, I'm looking forward to talking a little bit about inflation. I, I find uh, that it's it's becoming something that people are actually shouting at each other about right now. So I'd, yeah. I'd like to just take the the discussion back down a couple notches and just talk about it a little bit. Well, I I got to confess, uh, I went into it with the attitude that, well, here's three or four hours of my life that I'll never get back. Um, but I actually enjoyed um, many of the stuff that's on our reading list, which, by the way, will be added to the Manifest Forum, uh, the bibliography, or if you want to look at it that way, when we get done. All right. Well, congratulations to the Los Angeles Rams for winning the Super Bowl. It was a pretty good game for those who watched. Uh, I haven't heard any of the ratings reports, but I, I suspect it did fairly well. Um, a lot of the parties that I'm aware of were subdued, but they were still out there. And uh, as an old NFL team, the, uh, it theoretically um, portends a pretty good year for investors. So we are, any anybody who is a real uh, in, investing from the heart person uh, should have been cheering for the Rams. And uh, but we completely understand people like Marty Ackerley and his band of rogues down in the Cincinnati area that may have been, uh, you know, basically voting with their heart for the the Bengals, pulling for the Bengals. But uh, over the long term, although it has not been that reliable of an indicator for the last several years, uh, when the old NFL team wins, stock market does pretty well. Now. I'm not sure what's going to happen when the Detroit Lions win the Super Bowl, Ken. Hell's going to freeze over. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we can throw all the numbers out the window. That's Armageddon. Or... Yeah, it's it's finished. The world's over. <laughs> so, now, yeah. well, interestingly enough, the picture in the background there is the brand new stadium in Los Angeles, which I actually would like to see. The thing is massive. Um. So the, the Rams were gifted with playing on their home field. That's the, by the way, it's the second year in a row. Tampa Bay, Tampa Bay played on their home field last year for the Super Bowl. So at some point, the American Conference has to get a little bit upset about the NFC teams playing on their home fields. All right, I left this one in here just because I like it because it's colorful. It's just a reminder that uh, our Groundhog Nation has done a pretty good job of stock picking over the last five years. Good stuff. And there's our creed. Again, a reminder and a nudge that if you're not familiar with Benjamin Graham, David L. Babson, or George Nicholson Jr., that you, uh, if you're serious about investing, you probably want to understand who they were and how they thought. Nicholson in particular, um, as the grandfather of the modern investment club movement is regarded by many to be that grandfather, uh, he, he basically championed simplicity or uh, stepping back from the chaos of information that's out there and focusing on the things that really matter. So definitely worth knowing a little bit more about. And obviously from that slide, it's worked out okay for our groundhogs over the last five years anyhow. All right. All right, so let's have a little bit of fun with the, the accountants. That It's the accounting firm that we retain to actually go over the groundhog results every year when the sun sets on groundhog day we're ending one contest and beginning another and i'm gonna i think i'm gonna have to find a different incentive form of incentive for these guys ken because uh, i slipped up a little bit this year and they were awfully focused on the pizza and the beverages and uh, <laughs> you can see the shambles that they left the conference room in there that by the way that's a super bowl ad from career builder uh, from a few years ago, but uh, this is the situation I was left with, and it was kind of a mess, and the mess extended into the the interpretation of the results. It was kind, <laughs> kind of uncomfortable. And here is basically what happened. Um, some of you may remember, Kim and Ken, do you remember when, the, when uh, Bonnie and Clyde actually named the wrong winning movie? At the Oscars a few years ago, I certainly do. Uh, they were given the wrong envelope, so we can't especially blame the people that were on stage. But 
at the same time, it was certainly a mess. They had the whole group of folks up there on stage from the one movie, and then they had to pull up another whole big group of folks from the other movie. So everybody's running around congratulating everybody else, and nobody really figured out who won, I don't think, until the next day. Well, they, they corrected it that night, but it was ugly, and it was very, uh, very confusing. And it left us with Warren Beatty kind of wandering around on the stage, as I recall. <laughs> but anyhow, we've been celebrating the Space Coast Model uh, Club as the champions of the group portion of the contest. And they, they still win, but as it turns out, it was a tie. And uh, here's a quick look at I had to go back and actually go point by point and uh, audit every single entry for the Space Coast group. Um so you can see they had a pretty good collection of stocks. You can see that, uh, what is that, uh, over half of them actually beating the market. Pretty good return at 26.2%. But, yep, being from Florida, you just knew we were going to have some type of ballot controversy. Um, hence the graphic there on the right. We had, had to go over the Chad stuff do a little bit of recount and stand on our heads and, and get the chimps back in order. And when all is said and done, we had to pull a, a Steve Harvey. Steve Harvey is renowned or infamous for naming the wrong beauty pageant winner a few years ago. And so we had our Steve Harvey moment. And we have to point out that both clubs, Mid-Michigan Model and Space Coast, came in at 26.2%. So they will share the group championships for uh, the trailing year. So congratulations, Ken. Take us out. Well, of thank now. you. Thank you so much. And I offer my congratulations to Space Coast. This is such an honor, Mark, you know, <laughs> so. Are you going to thank your mother and your father and Cleveland, Later. Cleveland Later. Browns fans Later. everywhere? Cleveland Browns fans <laughs> everywhere. And, and, Cleveland Indian fans also, although I'm not sure what they're going to be called going into the future, but uh, uh, it, it's really nice to root for teams like like that that don't win very much because you don't have to root the whole season. You know where it's headed pretty quickly most of the time. So I, I'm, I can speak with great expertise in that area. <laughs> All right, so congratulations, and that's what the, what the car, scorecard will reflect going forward. We have not one, but two winning groups for 2021. And a nice job by both. All right, this is one more slide on the historical groundhog. We'll talk about where we're at in this year's groundhog, but this is in response to some questions I got after last week's. There were a couple of gaps that I went back and filled in on uh, institutional or call them celebrity participants in the, the, the annual groundhog. And the question that I got was, why do you guys seem to care so much about Brown Small Company? That's a mutual fund, uh, which by, incidentally grew out of an investment club, Eddie Brown and an investment club, and uh, has become quite an established and uh, five-star gold fund over the years. They had a rough year in 2021, but they are a three-time champion as the the rhino or institution in the rhino or institutional category. And then you see there were, I also got to know why are we paying attention to David Einhorn? And uh, outside of being an outstanding poker player, he uh, he has had some pretty good years. And uh, you see he's a two-time winner. So that's just to kind of do some cleanup and, and uh, retrospective on winners of this contest. John Kimmel's one of us. He, he actually puts together the Brookfield Digest out of Wichita, which is a compilation of guru or talking head opinions and uh he had his good year there and he's got a couple of extremely well accomplished uh investment clubs out of the wichita area also so anything else on there you would like to point out ken or no i uh i always like to look at some of the things on this list uh uh there uh, that this list seems to be a roller coaster with a lot of these uh entries you know you're you're uh what are they? What's the from the old song? You're riding high in April, shot down in May. So uh, um, I'm looking at at Kathy Woods, who was riding high in 2019, and 
boy, 2021 came along and just put the end to that. And I think there's a couple of, of similar things on here. And then you have your old standbys. I mean, uh, who would predict that Warren Buffett would win in 2014 and then come back seven years later uh, when he's in his 80s and win again? So, yeah, pretty, pretty strong formula there, commitment to a, yeah. a process. And Ken, Ken Hebner is very concentrated. So when he gets hot, he gets really hot. Um, when he gets cold, really, really cold. I, well, how many positions does he have? I think it's less than 30, which is, you know, really small for a mutual fund. And, of course, Eddie. Eddie is in there at the top of the leaderboard every year. Eddie Elfenbein, uh, that's 20 stocks uh, for Eddie. And he's a, he's been a contender every single year. He doesn't do a lot of trading in those 20 either, does he, Mark? Uh, no trading. No trading. That's what I, okay. He, no, he no runs, trading at all. Okay. Yeah, he runs it from Christmas to Christmas, though, so it's different than Groundhog Day to Groundhog Day, but it still gets the job done. All right. So let's just talk just for a moment for this year's this year's results, which are only a week and a half old. But uh, Sandy Caster's into an early lead. George Mackey is right there at the top. He finished at the top of this year's results. Curtis Sears is also a recent former champion. And there is uh, one of uh, John Kimmel's in investment clubs, a former champion, long-term investment club. You notice I did skip over Jim Booyah Kramer. I don't expect Jim to stay up there. But uh, Brown Small Company is near the top of this one. Uh, a nod to Herb Lemkul's uh, interesting collection of 10 companies this year, which I dubbed Sin, Soap, and Soup. <laughs> That just makes me want to see what he has in it. And you'll be able to do that here shortly. I'll show that. Uh, the one the one that I'm, I am frightened of is Graham Stephan's monkey, and we're going to take a look at that one also. The dark I think you should be, be frightened of your, your uh, son-in-law up there at number 10, you know? <laughs> yeah, he's dangerous too. Yeah. As long as people Don, keep buying boats and coffee. And Don Sheets is uh, is a really really smart guy from one of my investment clubs. He's a he's one of the wolves, and I didn't even know he was in the contest. But there he is at number eleven. Okay. Yep. So it's it's really early in this one, but uh, you see a lot of familiar names and a few new names on that list. Also, the return is at minus four, but the market is down uh, about that also, and. Uh, we're back to numbers. We're going to have about 170 participants this year, uh, roughly 40% of them beating the market. And because of the reset, Kathy Wood is no longer down at the bottom. She's 49th out of 168 and knocking on the top 40. And uh, with what's going on in the market today with GameStop, uh, Sean Mace just might be in the pole position by the end of the day. All right. Here are the consensus selections for 2022, and a lot of you uh, picked Facebook, and uh, that's not fortunate. Facebook actually took quite a hit on uh, the evening of Groundhog Day, and uh, selected by 53 participants, it's actually done considerable damage to a few portfolios already. But you can see up at the top the companies that were selected most often, and uh, this portfolio will be available it's got a pretty good track record over the years. It's probably a pretty decent place to go shopping for ideas. You see a lot of very high quality and a lot of uh, respectable return forecasts on this page. All right. Anything surprise you here, Ken? Nothing really surprises me. It's a, a list of names where if you're uh, heavy into the Better Investing Manifest Investing community. You've heard of almost all of these stocks in the last year, year and a half. Uh, I am a little bit surprised that it tilts so much to the large cap, uh, but uh, at the same time, I think those are the stocks that are controlling a lot of the market at the moment. Uh, I still would would like to see uh, a few more smaller cap stocks making the run uh, up near the top of these lists, but uh, it is what it is. So, yeah, and even though they're extremely large cap, they are among the faster growers among the large caps for sure. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Uh huh. So interesting stuff. So that's that is there. 
And Kurt has actually established the scoreboard for this year. It's available from the homepage at Manifest Investing or that link up at the top. That is a public link. And I have begun filling them in. I started with some of the people that were at the top of the leaderboard. So this is from yesterday. Um, so there'll be a few more filled in. But as, as we were saying, you can go check out Herb's uh, Sin Soap and Soup uh, recipe anytime you, you feel like it. And then... As an example, here is the Stephen Graham monkey entry for this year. We did a couple of sessions last summer. And we actually had quite a bit of fun with the, the dartboard tossing uh, chimpanzees. So these are five selections made completely at random. You know, random number generator, for, uh, looking at all the stocks in the manifest investing universe. And I'll be darned if the, if the little primate didn't come up with a pretty good uh, hit on five pretty good stocks. Um, it'll be interesting to watch. They're not all conventional, but uh, kind of well, and, go ahead. And Tom. I'm just I'm just thinking back to my days in statistics, Mark. And if if this is truly generated randomly, uh, I would expect after a very short amount of time this portfolio to be matching the market pretty closely. And that's exactly what it's doing, isn't it? Isn't that 992,000 awful close to what the market's doing at this point in the contest? It, it is pretty close. Yep. So I, I'm i not at all surprised. Uh, I, I would think that it will take some time for for this to separate unless uh, the, the random generation of numbers uh, you know, just just hits on a on a on an average uh, that that's going to propel it. I I don't know. Uh, I'm surprised that I even know one of the stocks that it hit randomly. Uh, and I've at various times I've owned Martin Marietta. So uh, uh, interesting stock, doing the worst of the group. But well, yeah, that's definitely infrastructure, and of course the oil and gas Magellan Midstream and Cato. I think is a badly damaged. Uh, retail apparel company. I don't know how badly damaged. I mean, the quality rating is pretty low. Arcos is, I believe, uh, a foreign form of some restaurant, I don't, and it escapes me which one that would be. And One Made Holdings is a is a financial services firm. So interesting. Let's see what happens. All right, switching gears to our best small companies for this year. Uh, again, we trail the market a little bit, but again, it's early. Nowhere near Halloween. Um, I'm always impressed by. I, it's it's always fascinating to me, Ken, how the ones those top three companies seem to to really latch onto some momentum and do pretty well. And the the same is true at the other end. The ones that don't have momentum uh, seem to misbehave and continue to misbehave year in and year out. And uh, maybe there's something to be learned from that. But in general, pretty good performance top to bottom. Nothing to get uh, the heebie-jeebies over yet, in my opinion. Well, the only one that even comes uh, to a place where we should be talking about it is that Chinese company, Green Tree Hospitality. And we've, we've spent a little bit of time talking about it already. Uh, I, I still don't. I still don't see why uh, what what you see in this company, but at the same time, it it is sitting with a huge base of population that it couldn't grow from. So, well, it's, uh, it's a pandemic yeah. turnaround for sure. Yep, and it's currently being impacted by what's going on in China. The Olympics is probably not helping uh, with the way they've got things clamped down quite a bit, but. The only thing we can do at this point, I think, because it has dropped off a little bit, is to monitor and specifically monitor uh, the situation out here. And, you know, if those numbers are real, which is always an if with a Chinese company, just make sure that they stay strong. Because if, if they do actually come out of it, stabilize and head back north uh, up there, and then here's earnings down here, um, we probably will be okay. But... Uh, if if we also get a spike up in price and an opportunity to sell, uh, perhaps we stay vigilant for that also, Ken. 
Uh, Mark, we're getting a question that we've gotten a number of different times. This time it's coming from one of our friends down in Texas, from Ann Manning. And Ann wants to know exactly what price was used uh, as the starting price for the stocks in the contest. Yeah, the start, the ending price for 2021 is the closing price on 2-2, two, two, uh, Groundhog Day, February 2nd. And that's also the starting price for the next year. So it's it's literally the the starting price for 2021 is the excuse me the closing price for 2021 is the starting price for 2022. Yeah, I think we have a a couple of folks that are are at, we're anticipating that the opening price on on the next day would be the start price, but Mark's been pretty consistent over the years. Uh, that the uh, closing price on Groundhog Day would be the price that's used to uh, tabulate the new entries. So uh, there's there's consistency there, and there's it's the same thing that's been done in all of the contest years prior. So no nothing's changing, and nothing's being updated or or whatever. So yeah, uh, Anne's Anne's coming back. Uh, uh, oh, she's coming back and talking actually about the heavy hogs, Mark. Uh, what What's the benchmark uh, price that you put on the heavy hogs? Uh, she's wondering if it maybe was 50000 uh as a start price. Yeah, there's 20, 20 positions here, so 50000 was the starting point. And okay, so I, this, I think I corrected is... that to, to January 2nd. So All right. So this is as me. if it were uh, as if it were a contest entry, right? Right. Okay. And I, I may be off on that, and it may, may may get adjusted as soon as I can round up the chimpanzees in the conference room. We'll get that fixed if it needs to be and, fixed. And you didn't mean January second; you meant February second, right? I I did. The chimps are really getting to me. Okay. <laughs> More caffeine, Mark, more caffeine. <laughs> We're working on that too. Yeah, this year, trust me, I'm sitting there, you know, tabulating. I was working with the chimpanzees in the conference room that evening, and I'm watching the news on Facebook, and then I'm watching all the entries for Facebook come in, you know, for the for the Groundhog Challenge. I'm like, oh, no. You know, <laughs> I, and then, it, it, I don't know. It's, I got, go ahead. Well, I got that. I got that text later in the evening, Mark, I don't know, 8.30, 9 o'clock in the evening about whether you should consider using the opening price from the next day. And so I told you what I did in my contest, and then I asked you what you had done in the past. So, yeah, that it, that's always a tough call. Um, yeah, just stick, stick with what you've always done. Yeah. I, I will say that in the grand scheme of thing, things, it probably will not make that much of a difference uh, historically. And uh, we'll we'll see if that continues to hold true. But I will I was wincing, but I will confess to all of you I was grateful that I didn't select Facebook. <laughs> all right, so let's go ahead and switch gears. I've got uh, eleven thirty. We got time to spend uh, fifteen twenty minutes talking about inflation. And uh, I think I heard you say earlier, Ken, this is kind of a a theme. Uh, inflation is making people angry, and. Uh, that's why I put the anger guy on the slide there. And uh, what we're going to do here over the next few minutes is just kind of randomly pull up some snippets of reading material and that sort of thing. Might have to finish it next week. I don't know. But as I look at the topic of inflation, um, like I said earlier, I was prepared to waste three or four hours of my life. I actually ended up enjoying going over the stuff that we're going to take a look at as we delve into this subject. But you know, the you basically go from that flavor of academia slash history, which is this infamous article, which is good history, but from my perspective, not terribly actionable or guiding as an investor. And then Brian Westbury, he's the economist at First Trust in Chicago. I think he kind of nails it here with that's a tweet from uh, last week. And uh, we'll just delve into that a little bit more. What, what are your... Uh, Thoughts from 35,000 feet as we start this, Ken? Well, from 35,000 feet and from plus 20 years on his 55, uh, I do have visceral understanding of what inflation is. Uh, I'll 
I'll tell a real short story, Mark, about uh, sitting in 1975 uh, with my superintendent in his office, uh, working on the paperwork to file for a bond issue for our school district. Uh, in the state of Michigan, you have to fill out all kinds of paperwork uh, before you can bring a bond issue to the voters uh, to ask them to uh, basically finance uh, uh, some kind of a growth project. Usually it's building in sight of some sort. And one of the questions was, uh, what do you anticipate inflation to be average during the course of this bond issuance? And we were issuing 30 year bonds. <laughs> and at the point we were looking at inflation in 1975, we were looking at inflation that had covered around the mid or high teens in various places. And we both thought we were being extremely conservative when we were, uh, when we finally chose 8% inflation as the average going forward for the next 30 years. Uh, little did we know how how wrong we would be, and uh, when you when you think about it, uh, it it made it a little bit tougher for us to pay off our bonds uh, because the growth in the value of the property in the school district didn't grow nearly as quickly as we had anticipated it was going to, and that means that the money to back it up. Uh, didn't get as large as fast, and so you had to do some creative things in making sure those bonds, uh, the obligation to those bonds was met on a yearly basis. But Mark has circled the exact time that we're, we're thinking of, and that inflation, uh, I, I, we had a school board member that uh, had to leave a meeting early uh, because he was taking his parents to the bank and they were rolling over their CDs from 17% to 19% uh, at the bank level. These were just normal, regular, plain old vanilla certificates of deposit and they were getting 19% on them uh, because they had a lot of money uh, sitting there too to put into these things. Uh, that uh, shaded my thoughts about finance uh, for a good many years. Uh, I worried about how my savings could be eaten up and that led me directly to, <laughs> to investing in the stock market. Well, that's cool. Yeah, I mean, this is, this is a infographic from Visual Capital and uh, it actually puts that period that you were sitting there sweating into some context. And I think context is important because this is what we've been living with through the vast majority of my investing career. You know, this is fairly steady stuff at pick a number between two and 3% and uh, with some dips down. And uh, I don't know, I, I, a couple of things I would highlight here is I tend to, anytime it's a historical chart, I generally drop it off about right here and don't pay attention to anything over here because that is quote unquote ancient history. Uh, it's particularly true in the realm of investing with the changes that happened with the SEC in the 1930s and uh, 1941 with the, with the Investment Company Act. It really did change the landscape of investing. So I tend to kind of disregard this with the exception of noting. And uh, this is this is that just in case we do get into a little bit of hyperinflation here in the coming months, um, anytime we've had this situation, it's actually been a pretty, I mean, the roaring 20s were actually pretty good for stocks until the end of the 1920s. The inflation that we had post-World War II actually led to a really nice period for investors in the late 1950s. The 1970s actually ended up um, it was actually a pretty good period for people who invested regularly, and it actually kicked off from 1982 through many, many years uh, up until the turn of the century. One of the best stock markets in, in stock market history, the, the de two decade long run. And so anytime we've had that type of uh, uh, inflation, turbulent uh, excess, um, it's actually been a pretty good time to be invested. We're going to see a little bit, a few snippets that basically back that up a little bit. 
Anything else jump off here, Ken? No, uh, except to say that that I I don't know whether or not day to day life uh, was that different uh, with inflation sitting uh, at the place that it was in the seventies. Uh, the people still uh, grumped about uh, prices. They still uh, made a lot of outlandish statements about things. They still got terribly, terribly upset about gasoline prices, even though the difference in a tank of gas didn't vary by uh, enough over a year's time to, to warrant the kind of outrage that was being felt. It was a symbol rather than anything else. And mm -hmm. it just seems to all be be presenting itself out there again. You know, you, I'm, I'm hearing uh, stories about bacon and about bread and about gas and about oatmeal. Uh, oatmeal. used cars, oatmeal, okay. And, and uh, I, I want, I, I wish uh, that people would, would back off just a little bit and, and understand that, that uh, it, it we got through whatever we got through in the 70s and 80s, and and I think that we'll get through whatever we get through uh, in the 2020s and and beyond. Uh, I I just don't understand people that that feel that when you talk about something on a 24-hour news cycle, they feel that the impact is going to happen tomorrow, and it doesn't. It doesn't work that way, folks. It it takes a little bit longer for all the positive stuff to work its way in, and it takes just as long for some of the negative stuff to work it in. Uh, I I do think that we're in for a lot more on the roller coaster going forward, uh, but uh, how, when, where? I'm not willing to predict that, and I don't think Mark is here to predict that either. No, predicting inflation is tough. I wouldn't want to have been in your chair in 1975. But a couple articles here. The first one, this is the only thing I'm sharing from this Joshua Brown article up at the top. I think it's important, though, because when we look back and we look at some of the writings of Nicholson and, and for that matter, Benjamin Graham and others, uh, things have changed. Uh, there's a lot of things that are not different than uh, as they've been over the course of human history, but... I do think that the structure of the economy is different. I agree with Josh on this one. Probably have to think about it a little bit differently. And it's one of the areas that's gotten Kathy Wood into the most uh, uh, roll around in the mud type situations because she talks a lot about disinflation and the advantage of some of the innovative technologies and that sort of stuff. But I do think we do have to be prepared to think a little bit differently about, uh, about it, at least from 34,000 feet. So that's the first one I would point to. And uh, the second one there is an article. It's actually quite a lengthy article. And if you, if you really want to settle in with a cup of coffee or a cup of tea and enjoy it uh, academically and uh, empirically, that's Jesse Livermore. It's that, I'm pretty sure that's a pen name for a guy who works for uh, O'Shaughnessy at O'Shaughnessy Asset Management. And this article from a little while back, uh, again, just kind of encapsulates um, my okay, Mark, you, you just, you just, Mark, you just cut out. Uh, are you with? How, are you how, there, Mark? How long was I out? Can you hear me now? Hello. I we hear you. Uh, Mark, yeah, I can I, hear you, and you were just out for maybe. Okay. You you can hear me okay now, right? Okay. Can you hear me now, Kim? Yeah, you were breaking up. You were going in and out. Maybe maybe the maybe the internet is okay, is, is rough up there. Check and see where all your pets are at. In case they're chewing on cords or anything up there. But no, this one this one is from O'Shaughnessy Asset Management. We'll get dig in a little bit deeper to it, but kind of my outlook it, it kind of matches my outlook is that if you if you keep doing what we're doing, uh it's kind of fascinating when the the bad news is good news and it gets all kind of twisted around. But uh, we appear to be in one of those markets we have been for some time. And I would kind of characterize that as the wall of worry uh, type uh, 
thinking? Your thoughts, Ken or Kim? I guess my thought is on all of this is life is a cycle, markets are a cycle, sectors are a cycle, and we just need to recognize to look back as to uh, what happened in the last time we had inflation and recognize that change is constant. So what areas are gonna do better because they have change and things are, um, the same products are getting used more efficiently. Yeah, the productivity See, definitely comes through. Your thoughts, Ken? See, I, I don't think we have to, to look for different kinds of companies, and I don't think we have to do a lot of thought as to, to who necessarily is going to do better in inflationary cycles. I think we're looking for the same thing during inflationary times as we looked for in non-inflationary times, and that's a, a good management team that can take the resources it has and turn it into a profit. Uh, and I, I still think some of our most basic measurements uh, are showing which management teams can do that, and that's the companies that we need to gravitate towards. Uh, I think you put that all down to one word, uh, you look for quality, and we're still, I think, uh, should be focused on quality. Uh, I like to focus on quality in a little bit smaller setting, uh, but focusing on quality, no matter if it's in a, a huge, gigantic company or in a little tiny startup company, uh, I think those managers will either show us they can, they're up to the job, and if they can't show us they're up to the job, then uh, they're not going to be around to do much managing uh, going forward. Uh, I told Mark before we started this uh, whole uh, session today that that I still have a, a tendency to want to buy companies that make some money. Uh, I just can't get interested in companies without earnings. Uh, and I can hear all the, the, the horns blowing and all the hype going on about uh, this company is going to do this in five years or this in 10 years or this in 20 years. And, and I say to myself, uh, and maybe I'm finding myself saying it more often, uh, well, then I'll invest in you five years from now when you can demonstrate what you say you're going to do. Uh, but right now, you're nothing more than a, a, a twinkle in somebody's eye, and I don't want to invest in very many twinkles. Well, I jumped ahead a few slides just because I didn't want to ask you to repeat yourself, but that, that rhymes with this one, too. Uh, Buffett basically saying the best thing, first of all, do the best you can with your own personal situation. Optimize that. And then part two is, is just what we've been doing for eight decades in the modern investment club movement. Find excellent businesses and buy them when they're attractively priced. Pretty simple stuff. And, and, and I will say, Mark, that, that there might come a time, uh, I don't know when, but it might be in the near future. It might be two years out, five years out, but there might come a time when when fixed income is very attractive, especially to folks that are trying to maintain a nest egg of some sort. Uh, but right now, fixed income is no more attractive to me than it's been in the last 20, 25 years. Uh, I still don't want to take and, and go to a cash a position, a full cash position, and then drop it into an account somewhere. I don't care where the account sits, and I don't care what they tell me uh, is the safety behind it. Uh, I want some growth to at least partially offset the inflation, and I'd like enough growth to completely offset the inflation. If I end up with 3% real growth, then I'm, I'm happy. I'm, I'm I'm going to survive. I'm going to make it with no problem at all. And uh, I think that's what you have to keep in the top of your head. Uh, you know, those those people getting those uh, high double teen returns on certificates of deposit uh, were just barely keeping track of keeping you know, keeping even with inflation, mm -hmm. uh, maybe they were losing one or 2% on some years and maybe making a couple of percent. 
but if if that becomes an interesting uh, option uh, sometime in the future, then I'm going to take it. But for the moment, I think the only interesting options we have are what we've always been doing in the last 20, 25 years, and that's looking for high quality, great companies at prices that we think are reasonable. Yeah, as part of that article, and this is something you might want to do for as a homework assignment, especially if you're on the south side of that 55 age group. Um, 1974, Coca-Cola. Take a look at it. You can actually do, Google some articles. I'll add one to the, the bibliography, but that's what this guy was doing. He wasn't buying bonds. He was buying Coca-Cola. So interesting stuff. All right, from the rest of that Jesse Livermore article from O'Shaughnessy, I'm um, not going to read this to you, just going to point out that he goes through, this is a sample, just a taste, and I, uh, he basically classifies inflation into four different categories or flavors, and I think we're seeing some of the cost push inflation from energy costs. I think we're seeing demand pull disruption from the pandemic uh, supply side stuff, supply chain stuff. Uh, structurally, we're seeing some of the challenges from uh, minimum wage increases and a variety of things. Um, the growing awareness of the uh, inequality gap in wealth is is, is is part of that also. And then last but not least, that hyperinflation is what Ken was describing back in the mid-1970s. And I would just encourage you to take a look at those. And there's some, some of the stuff at play uh, across, kind of across the board. Well, I, I want to go back to that third one there, Mark, and just make the point that uh, maybe uh, at some point uh, it, it becomes a, a good time to remind folks that if you're going to uh, have a workforce, uh, then you have to have children to, to grow up and fill those jobs. And I think a uh, part of what we're seeing today in uh, this work stuff was brought on by the pandemic, uh, but it's kind of been lurking in the background for quite a while. Uh, school districts hit the, the wall in the 80s and the 90s when suddenly there weren't enough kids to fill all the buildings and all the classrooms. Uh, today, there's not only a not, not enough kids, but there's not enough teachers and bus drivers and lunch ladies and, and all the rest of the kind of jobs that go with education. And education's only one industry where you can point to that and say there's, there's true labor shortages right now. A lot of it has to do with bodies. And uh, if we're not going to have those bodies uh, as natural children, then then maybe we have to re-examine the way that we allow people to to uh, enter the workforce and become part of this this country of ours. An another strike against China, by the way. Um, all right, moving on. All right, just as an example of the amount of disruption with what's been going on here lately, and that's why it's gotten, if you thought predicting stuff was difficult five years ago, um, it's gone off the charts, and uh, I, I, I guess I knew this was happening, but didn't really notice it. Kind of in autopilot when it comes to some of this kind of stuff. But yeah, the the government is just increasing the money supply at an unprecedented. I don't use that word very often. Unprecedented rate, and uh, until that slows down, uh, I think Brian Westbury's right. That's why we repeated the quote. All right, so that's there. Here's just more reinforcement. Fairly recent article from Barron's and uh, former chairman of the Federal Reserve Board, just kind of ripping away here. Or he's actually one of the governors. But uh, what I find interesting about this is, you know, you, you hear them talk in their Fed speak when they make their congressional testimony. And I got to agree with the author of this article. They don't even talk about uh, monetary policy when they're sitting there. And it's kind of annoying and um, be kind of nice to see that change. So, and that's a, that's a meme generated by a meme at uh, Reddit, I think on the lower right. 
pumping out some money. All right. In the spirit of context, and I think, Ken, this goes along with, you know, we talk about it on the 24-7 news. Um, this is actually from Ben Carlson at Ritholtz. And uh, just want to point out that we're not that dramatically different yet. Uh, I realize it's increasing. I realize that it's in a disruptive moment. Um, but it's still not terribly unusual yet. Um, just, just here, this is just for context and just this powerful reminder that, boy, when we have this situation, one of the best places to be is finding those excellent companies that we were just talking about. Any thoughts on this one, Ken? Well, nothing except to say amen. Uh, it's a it's a great graph. It's a great chart. It it makes a, a fantastic point. Uh, and uh, you know, let's let's give ourselves six months or a year and see where we're at at that point. Uh, I know that we can project these numbers almost anywhere we want to project them. Uh, and I know that the the people on on your screens are are uh, are livid uh, about a lot of this stuff, but that that seems to be the normal state of affairs with with newscasters and policymakers. Mm -hmm. uh, that everybody's livid about everything, and that's not a, a a way that you can can solve problems if you're always angry at everything and. <laughs> and are looking for quick, easy, simple answers. They don't exist. And uh, we, we need to recognize that and then uh, start talking to each other rather than at each other. All right, and here's the, the gas pump uh, chart that uh, we were talking about earlier. I guess the way I look at this is I get kind of annoyed, and this is the nightly news and a lot, a lot of uh, academics and whatever, um, they, they look at these year to year things. And I always ask, well, what's the trend look like? You know, what does the trend really look like? And yeah, I, I agree that it's uncomfortable paying that price at the pump, but what does the long-term trend look like? And uh, Mark Holbert goes through with, in this article and does a pretty good job of pointing out that uh, there's a pretty good trade off and, uh, you know, inflation, is growth. It's kind of a weird way to think about it, but we've been missing an, a component of growth in our visual analyses on the stock selection guides for years. Companies like McDonald's and others, you know, with the virtual absence of inflation, everything is organic growth. Um, a little bit of inflation is not a bad thing. Now, when it gets out of control, obviously, different, you know, the gloves come off. But, you know, and a component of growth has been missing for a while. And uh, a lot of times the growth in the earnings, is, it's a pretty good trade-off, unless it gets out of control, again, with that caveat. So that's an interesting article. And then I put this one in here just to show how nasty the disruption can be. This is the price of crude oil um, over the last couple of years. And you can see how... The, how the pandemic and the recession and that really nasty moment when it actually went negative last year and it has rebounded and, and gone absolutely crazy. Uh, this article, article from Guru Focus actually has steps through some fairly interesting stuff. But again, just pointing out that uh, the highest quality company is going to control borrowing costs and profitability and all that kind of stuff. All the stuff we said earlier with that slide with Buffett and when, with Ken and uh, discussing, you know, finding the best companies, uh, they're going to account for the stuff that's at the top of this page. But again, the size of this uh, disruption, this destructive interference is significant over the last several years. And I, I'm not sure, it might be the worst going back 50 years. All right, and that does lead to the situations like this. So let's, let's just spend a couple minutes talking about, well, how, what do we do? We've all, already been kind of seeding the table here, but for economically sensitive companies like BP Amico, um, maybe it is time to pay even a little bit more attention to times when the relative strength index gets up here or down here. 
one of the reasons I really like this slide, this is actually from our monthly roundtables. And it's the five times that Hugh selected BP, while the rest of us, including the audience, you know who you are, all, all of us holding our noses while he's down there buying it between fourteen and twenty dollars a share, and uh, basically shopping when it's down around here when we have this situation, only to be presented with the opportunity to sell up here. Again, as the relative strength index actually went up above seventy for a while, but. These are some fairly considerable opportunistic results. And uh, as I was suggesting to Ken before we got started here, this is definitely an instance where we not only talk the talk, but definitely are walking the walk. Because we actually sold those yeah. positions at the round table. Go ahead, Kim. I was gonna say, um, we always need to recall that uh, buying low is good and selling high is better. And when you see what the RSI is, you know, granted, the RSI can stay high for a long time where you've got the, the first circle mark and the second arrow, but that doesn't mean it will stay that high. And you, as you're sh the picture you showed earlier where the price of um, West Texas crude and what it is now, you know, if you buy it when the price of oil was down at $30 a barrel or lower, and then you sell it when it's all the way up to 90, you know, you can't, you really shouldn't keep thinking it's gonna fly high forever. Yeah, and so, and Ken, I'm sure you're itching to back up, back me up on this. This is not a, a core traditional holding. This is a company that can be bought and sold as is suggested by this graphic. But the other thing that kind of jumps off me off, off the page for me here, and then I'll turn it back to you, is that blue line right down the middle, that's more representative of the value of this particular company. And just notice how much the price drifts, ebbs and flows up and down away from that blue line. Uh, the real value of the company is basically on that blue line. And... Uh, it's just opportunity anytime you get a big difference above or below. And the blue line represents a moving average. Is the 60 after the MA a 60 day moving average? Is that what it is, Mark? It actually would be a 60 month. So you're talking about a five, month, year. a five year, a five year moving average. Okay. So, you know, anytime you hear people talk about, you know, price is basically an opinion. Uh, you know, of what the company, you know, could be traded up for on a given moment. It's not necessarily the value, the difference between the price and the value. It's right there on that screen. And uh, this is this is uh, an example of a company. This is not Johnson Johnson or Aflac or any of those type of companies. This is a, a different animal. It's a, definitely a, a cyclical beast. All right, here's a fairly busy slide, but it comes from a really thorough presentation by John Hussman that, that uh, Nikki Pietreca, uh pointed out fairly recently. And it, uh, she said she got a pretty good chuckle from the, the highlighted quote there. And I, I did too. The best time to panic is before everyone else. <laughs> And really, uh, you know, if you listen to Buffett and you, you listen to the people that have a lot of experience, you know, even even 10 years ago or back during the 2008, 2009 excursion, Buffett said, I hope I get to experience this one or two more times in a lifetime because you get some really good bargains. And everybody said, you know, what I'll have some of what he's having, you know, what's he drinking? Um, but that's really what he's talking about here on the opposite side of the, the spectrum here. And um, Benjamin Graham just reminding us with big words that, yeah, uh, people do s silly things and uh, opportunity will manifest itself if you're ready and willing. All right. And then one last comment from uh, this actually came from some words from George Nicholson. He was talking about a Forbes interview with Benjamin Graham back in the mid 1970s. And uh, this, this is kind of where I form my thinking about how growth is part, inflation is part of growth. 
And uh, it kind of comes from that Graham observation. And uh, growth is not, you know, inflation is not necessarily a bad thing. Everything in moderation. And then I decided to quote myself because I found this while I was sniffing around, Ken, back from 2008. Uh, I'm not even sure who the guy was that wrote this, but I signed it. Um, yeah, if if things take off and get ugly, you basically have to to address that with your PE forecasts and your stock studies. I get that. He he talked about that quite a bit. But here 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 we are back. You know, 15 years ago, I'm talking about a disruption in oil prices, and uh, I just point out that you know if you really are buying excellent businesses or you're carefully looking at cyclical opportunities and you look at incremental costs and and how reliable the human component of all this is notoriously reliable um it's it's one of the greatest self-correcting systems that i'm aware of and uh, you just have to be observant and allow you know this thing called inflation as ken pointed out as we got started it's making people angry angry people do stupid things and if you if you remain calm and again, I get the thing from my wife, you know, you, you tell somebody to remain calm and they don't remain calm, but remain calm. You just can you find those type of opportunities. Any thoughts, Ken? I, no, I, I, I think I've said what I have to say that uh, I'm not going to change too much of what I'm doing. I told you before this whole thing uh, began that, that the only thing I find myself doing going forward is uh, as I'm evaluating new stocks for purchase or stocks for sale, I'm becoming uh, a little bit more conservative in my calls about high PEs and low PEs uh, or average PEs, whichever ever method I'm, I happen to be using. Uh, and I'm just, I think, recognizing the fact that PEs have been elevated uh, because there's been virtually no risk, nothing holding capital back, nothing, nothing to uh, worry about. Uh, for 15 years, we've had uh, uh, loose money, money that didn't cost hardly anything to borrow. And now that it's going to cost something to borrow, uh, good managers are going to have to take that into account. And that might lower the valuation on the company. Uh, I'm going to assume it does, uh, and I'm going to set uh, slightly lower PE values uh, moving forward, uh, anticipating that they will be the norm uh, going uh, into the next five, five, eight, ten years. Uh, that's the only thing that I'm doing differently, and I'm not being extremely aggressive in doing that even. Yeah, and here's a look just just for inf informational factoid. Uh, with the first two editions of Value Line updating to the new year, that's what this bar on the far right is. Uh, these are still taking shape; they're works in progress. But um, the the PEs three to five years out are still somewhat elevated, and uh, I don't expect this to come crashing down. But they are moderating, and so yeah, I think doing the study. So here's an example from this weekend. Um, Starbucks. And I, I just bring this up for uh, to note a couple of things. First of all, if a company appears on our This Week update and it's materially stronger, it's because of one of these type of situations. You know, the value line analysts basically see the the return forecast going up sufficiently to say, hey, that's a, that's a little bit special. But the other thing I want to bring up here is with Starbucks, they definitely were pandemic affected. They were almost pandemic wrecked. Uh, back in here so you can see the the real disruption that went through um, and I would encourage you to uh, and this is something Ken and I have talked about fairly extensively with uh, the disruptions to the top and bottom lines back in the chasm stuff that we did that C-H-A-S-M series that we did and I refer to this as a notch a V notch if you're if you're buying into an excellent company like Starbucks you really can look down the road and uh you know work your way through these chasms or natches and uh put into practical practical terms like ken was just talking about 
If this is my study of Starbucks, I'm probably not picking a PE of 25. I'm probably going to ratchet that down. And, you know, you look at the projected annual return at 12 versus 8 for the projected return on value. I'm probably going to knock that down to 24, 23, maybe 22 and a half just to build in an awareness that this is kind of going on with some of these companies. And uh, that number is probably a little bit elevated. I hope they're right, but uh, I'd rather not not forecast it or expect it. So, well, And I hope people don't gloss over the fact, Mark, that you made relatively modest adjustments to that P.E. Uh, I didn't hear you telling me you were going to adjust the P.E. down to 15. Uh, I didn't hear you uh, telling me that the company was going to suddenly start doing real wild and crazy things. I heard you tell me that you might adjust this PE somewhere in the five to ten percent range mm -hmm. downward, and and that's the kind of adjustments that I'm talking about as well. Uh, I think they're going to be relatively modest, uh, but at the same time. I'm looking at companies that have earned money. Uh, I think some of these companies that have uh, earned very little and that are presenting with PEs in the uh, 70s and 80s and 90s uh, are still in for a lot of readjustment. Uh, but uh, when we're looking at a high quality company like Starbucks, uh, I think that we can say to ourselves, you know, maybe seven, eight, ten percent downward in PE adjustment will give me an honest appraisal of where the company might be five years from now. Yep. So that's basically how you put it into practice. Again, be will being willing to pursue the cyclical opportunities if that is in your makeup and pursuing these good companies. All right, let's go ahead and close out for today. We can come back and cover some uh, uh some more of this and kind of a kind of a potluck catch up. Just want to point out that we do archive all of these sessions, including the round tables and our successful investing conferences on YouTube. Just go to YouTube, search for manifest investing. Uh, we'd appreciate it if you'd hit subscribe. I need to update this page because these are getting a little bit old, but I will do that. And uh, if you have any trouble, uh, send me a note. I'd be happy to help you find uh, this page also. And I think for today, we'll just go ahead and close with the, a tip of the hat to the E-Trade baby, who's now the Morgan Stanley baby. And for those of you who didn't watch the Super Bowl, this is the guys from Morgan Stanley zooming into his residence. Apparently, he's become a lumberjack since the early days of E-Trade. And uh, I just want to point out that, you know, investing as a fairly young person, look at the house that this young man is putting up there. I mean, this is this looks like a pretty nice place to be hiding out and going off the grid, and uh, they anyhow they whisk him off in a helicopter along with one of the other E Trade babies, and I I thought it was it, it could be the start of some good things for the Morgan Stanley babies. Mark, before you close, could you include on this tape? Uh, Ann Manning would just like you to show again how you're going to get to the 2022 Groundhog. Uh, boards uh, when they're finally all finished. Could you just show that real quickly on a manifest screen? Sure, we can do that right now. If I can get to it, oh geez. All right, so on manifest, Looks like I have a little bit of a lumpy internet also right now. Um, on the manifest homepage down here under published dashboards, it already is Groundhog 2022. There will be some notes in a, in a feature column here also. But by clicking on that, you can see that they're already here. And I'll go ahead and show off Herb's portfolio because some of you are just dying to find out what are, Sin Soap and Soup are. And you can see I've named it appropriately. <laughs> Herb.
Herb's a pretty wily stock picker, Mark. So, right. He's, uh, he's got know. an outstanding long-term <laughs> track record. And, yes, he and, does. Uh, <laughs> I, I just have this image of Herb standing out in the, in the rain with a cigarette and a, a beverage of his choice. And <laughs> uh, No, actually, I don't. I can't do that. I can see Herb eating ice cream. <laughs> All right. Enough frivolity. Anything else we need to cover, Ken? No, I think other than that, uh, we uh, uh, are up to date on our questions and everything. So uh, I'm going to uh, find my wife and grab my suitcase and we're off to my sister's so we can make it to the airport by 7 o'clock tomorrow morning. Excellent. Well, travel safely and happy Valentine's and happy stock picking out there to everybody. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Thanks for coming today, folks. We appreciate it. Good night.